everybody, and welcome to the Help on the Way podcast, a very special episode of the Help on the Way podcast. Um, you'll notice that I am neither game nor f I am your host, Nob. Um, it's just going to be me today with a very special guest, and everyone in my life can attest that I still can't believe I get to say these words. Our guest today is Betty Cantor Jackson. Uh, if you have been listening to the show or listening to the music of The Grateful Dead, uh, Betty's soundboard recordings are an immense part of that. Uh, the, the depths to which we have Grateful Dead music is not possible without her. Um, and I think that's uh, enough uh, over-reverence to get things started. Um, Betty, welcome to the show. Well, thank you and hello. We're so... I. I truly cannot express how cool it is to have you here. Um, you, how long did you work with the dead? Oh, let's see. Uh, I guess, let's see from, I actually started working in the end of, well, the end of 67, maybe just at the beginning of 68 and then through about 85. Okay. That's awesome. And of course, they still put out all my stuff, but. Of course, of course. Uh, including the uh, the recent 73 box set, which we'll talk a little bit about towards the end of the interview. Um, question that I've got, I mean, these are all questions that I've got, but how were you first introduced to the music of the Grateful Dead? Uh, but at the Avalon Ballroom. I went to the Avalon Ballroom when I was in high school to see the Jefferson Airplane. And that was my first time going to a, one of those kind of shows in the city. And uh, I... I was sucked into it, the scene, and then kept coming back. So, and that's where I first saw the dead was at the Avalon. And what was your first impressions of their music? Uh, rough. As sure. far as, uh, you know, more beastly or something, you know, something more, you know, it wasn't, wasn't like, way, like the airplane were a lot more, you know, and uh, the lighter weight versions and the uh, ho vocal harmonies and things like that, whereas the the dead were a little more bluesy, grungier, you know, darker, harder, or something just earthier. Sure. Yeah, I hear you. Um, and then when did you start getting involved working with the dead? Well, uh, I guess the first thing I, I worked at the Avalon for a long time and went through various positions there end up going and helping start the Denver dog and then coming and then quitting the dog when I got frustrated with the situation sure. and coming back yeah. and uh I had I had run into them and met some of their people in Denver when we had them come into Denver and play and uh then when I came back I uh met up with with Bob Matthews and started going to we started setting up for their second album doing uh, recordings, you know, and I just help him set up. It was interesting to me. Yeah. So I go along and help set up microphones and run cables. So that was for different stuff for uh, the second album when we, we did some recording at the Avalon and we did some recording at King's Beach Bowl. Oh, nice. And what was it like doing those early recordings? How was it especially compared to making recordings towards the end of your time with the dead. How was that different? Well, it was a lot more, you just grabbed it. It was, uh, you put it together, you know, it was something never done. Sure. All these things that we were doing were things that hadn't been done before. So we were trying things out. We were making things work, adapting things. So they did work. Right. That kind of stuff. That's awesome. We were always experimental in so many ways, you know, and it, I mean, it started from the beginning. We were just trying to make something work better than it did before. Sure. Especially on an album that is so experimental and so weird from a recording that standpoint, totally, like yeah. Anthem. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. Neat. Do you, jumping around a little bit, do you have a favorite period of your time with the dead? Well, I'm, I, I guess I have to say the... Well, all the seventies, really. I mean, okay. Uh, I I lost my husband, and Rex died in seventy six. So when we did the one tour after we had stopped playing for a while, and we did the seventy six tour, and Rex went out as the road manager. It's just, and uh, it was not long after that that he was killed in an automobile accident. So seventy six was special because he was still there. Seventy seven and seventy eight were special because we were such a tight 
group organization family that moved around. Sure. <laughs> you know, we were we were this capsule that would go around the country and it and that was special because we had so much we did everything together. We had so much camaraderie that it was it was special. But then we did everything kind of on our own. I mean, like the recording studio, I started the recording studio because I recorded Jerry's rehearsal to go into another recording studio mm -hmm. and Ron Tut, his drummer, liked the drum sound I got so well, he just wanted to do it there at the rehearsal hall. And so Jerry turned to me and said, you can have the 16 track here tomorrow, right, Betar? <laughs> I said, sure, Jerry, no problem. And I did, but I didn't have a board or anything. So I was just using my old um, Ampex mixers, tube mixers to feed the tracks. So I started doing Cats Under the Stars that way with just Ampex, with left, right, and center out of each microphone input. And that's what I had, period. Yeah. That's cool. But the tube, tube, you know, the tubes were sweet. So they sounded good. If I wanted to pan position, I'd have to put two mics on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there was no pan. There were no pans. It was only left, right, and center. So Nice. When you are... You know, how how often would you say you, you go back and listen to these old shows? Do you? Not often. Okay. Everyone, I, I do it more in the car because, you know, they'll be yeah. on my program. Some of them are programmed on my you know, my car, you know, so it'll sure. just, okay, I'll listen to that now. And then a lot of times I'll put, when I'm doing something else, and I started doing Chris Robinson, I'd put that stuff on there. So I'm checking out my mastering and stuff like that. So I end up doing it. A lot of that in the car, except when I'm actually working on the project at home. Gotcha. When you when you do listen to those tapes, like what what are you thinking about? Is it is it musically what the band is doing? Is it technically what you were doing? Is it the world around while it was going on? Combination, because I'll think, oh God, why didn't I turn that up? Or or I remember thinking I should do a little bit more, and then I get hesitant to change something because I don't want my dynamics to not be their dynamics, you know, I want sure. to leave that to them. Basically, I like my canvas to be open and let them play the music. But at times there's things that just, you know, and I'll go, why didn't I do that? Or, hey, I should have, you know, and I hear something. Uh, there's that, you know, what could I have improved, of course. But of course. Of course. Perfect that I am. No, I'm a detailer. And that, you can't get into a lot of details when it's live. Right. It's happening. It's already done. If you heard it, it's over with. Uh, I've told people that a lot. If you heard it, then I, there's nothing I can do anything about it because it's already happened. You know, it's history now. Yeah. So you got to be in front of things. Are there any like memorable technical mishaps that stand out to you oh. in your memory? <laughs> there's some serious ones. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's see. Do I want to get into that? Well, there was a fiasco at the Warfield. So we did 15 nights at the Warfield. Uh, and we had one. Is that the off. acoustic shows? We did acoustic and, uh, and electric both. We started. Yes. The first set was acoustic and then the next two sets were electric. And we went from the Warfield to Radio City. But what each of those two places had serious situations that happened, although... I got I got to brag about putting that together so well. I still came through and got it done. But <laughs> at the Warfield, absolutely every cable and connection in my studio that I built for this, uh, I put together as we were setting up. I just did it that way. And being I remember numbers, thank God. Uh, uh, extraordinarily good at remembering numbers. Uh, every single cable and connection in my in my studio had been unplugged. And they went through uh, about four or five different number changes as they came down from the stage as far as what snake, which line it went into, which you know, I had three boards I was using together uh, to accommodate all the uh, microphone inputs. Uh, so which which snake went to which board, which which went out to which other board, which went to which machine, which went to which track of that machine and which in all that kind of stuff. So when we came in an hour before the show started and everything was unplugged. Uh, Don Pearson, who was helping me, and uh, and Wiz, uh, they looked at me and said, "Well, we gotta get Matthews in here. He's got a list of all the numbers." And I said, uh, "Forget it. He's not gonna." If we went to the hotel. He's not answering the door. I said, "He's in there. He's just not gonna answer the door." This is Bob. <laughs> when he does this kind of stuff, he just 
cuts off and it, he rationalizes it never happened. He has nothing to do with it. And that's just the way it is, you know? And uh, so I told the boys to put the, they even, they even had the internal wiring of the tape machine unplugged, which there's only one way it can go. So there's absolutely no neatening up of the cables, which was the excuse for the changes. Yeah. <laughs> there was no neatening up to be done. There's only one way you can do it. So uh, I had the, the boys uh, put the machines back together because they didn't have to know any any of the changes of the number channels or any of that stuff. And I remember, like I said, I remember the numbers. So I ended up getting all plugged in. We didn't miss any any of the recording. I didn't miss a note. I was recording with that. I didn't have all my playback when they started playing, but I had that before they were done playing the acoustic set. Okay. Sure. But uh, yeah, I had it all plugged back in. The one in the uh, in Radio City was just as weird on a different level. What was happening? I think it was just um, I don't know, emotional reaction to the situation or something that put us in that position. Sure. That. Uh, Someone else's emotional reaction. <laughs> and another time I'll tell you about Radio City, but that's yeah. enough about the you know. Sure. Well, and those shows, those got then, the, the Warfield and the Radio City shows got released as, as Reckoning and as Dead Set. Um, when it comes to going from the live concerts to making those compilation albums, how much of a say did you have in ter- or even in terms of suggesting songs or performances of songs to go on those records oh a lot okay a lot well i already i knew we, when we were done recording which song was the best song of all the nights at the warfield which song was played the best which because i just remembered that stuff okay so that that one we're saving for the album and that one we're saving for the, the other ones we'll look around and you know various performances and what fits when it comes to albums time is a is such a uh Cerner of what you can put, you know, it, it's an absolute. You can only put so much time on a vinyl piece of vinyl. If you try to put more on, it sounds like crap. Right. So that limits what you can do. Sure. That was the only about the only good thing about CDs in my book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is you can put a lot of time on those babies. Doesn't matter. Uh, but they're not the dot. I still say digital's dot to dot, but it's gotten a lot better. The dots are closer together. Sure. Do you do any of the do you, do you listen to music on like streaming platforms or digitally? Somewhat, but not so much. I usually um a little more into either playing a record or playing a CD. Sure. And listening that way. Of I mean, course. I just streaming is really only when I'm in movement. Got it. I'm not going to sit down and listen to stream generally. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, speaking of official releases, you release, uh, you recorded the the Cornell May eighth, nineteen seventy seven show, um, which was released a few years back. is is well regarded within Deadhead circles and is in fact been entered into the National Recording Registry of the Library of Congress about ten years ago. How did that? feel to have a recording that you made uh, recognized in that way well oh, great I, I i don't know that i i personally got any recognition from it but i think i, I except for my own feeling of oh great they you know liked it that much that it made that you know it's it's not something i have uh you know a card business card says oh she recorded Cornell. <laughs> yeah, of course and it's like, no i mean yeah, there's a lot you know there's other ones that actually, okay, I recorded that one. It's credited to somebody. That's okay. I can tell if it's mine or not. People say, did you record this? I said, I don't know. If I listened to it, I can tell you right off if I recorded it or not. What are the things that you listen for when being able to tell if you recorded it or not? Is it just a gut space. thing or are there specific things you listen for? Space. It's all about the space. Okay. And how I hear space. It's uh, the, the, the image is usually bigger and wider and broader and real left and right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Obviously, the, the music of the dead has been proliferated through the, the taper community. What was your relationship with the Grateful Dead tapers like while you were working with the band? 
I really didn't have much interaction with the tapers. And I, I see a lot of feedback. Or every so often I see feedback. Somebody saying, oh, I stood behind Betty when she was, you know, and it's like, actually, you didn't. <laughs> Sorry to bust the bubble there, but I was never in the audience. So there's yeah. no way in hell you stood behind me. Uh, the person is, in fact, even in the, the archive at Santa Cruz, they have a picture of Candace say it's me. And it's like, uh, because she's got a headset on, it's actually a clear comm intercom that she's wearing and she's sitting in front of the light board, but they say it's me because they don't understand that that's a clear comm and not a set of headphones. Sure. You know, I think they need to be a little more discriminating who picks out. It's like, now that's not really a guitar. It's a piano. You know, how can you tell the difference? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like, hello. <laughs> and somebody was publishing a book and they sent me a picture and that same picture, Candace went with a parent. It's like, I was never out there. And in fact, on a couple of tours, we had t-shirts that mine said, yes, I am. And hers said, no, I'm not. Because people kept coming up to her and asking her if she was me because she's sitting next to Healy out in front at the mix board, sure. you know. I'm up on the stage next to the monitor mixer. I'm either, uh, in 76, I used a dressing room separate. And then I decided I got to be on stage so I see what the hell's going on. So I just, from then on, I set up on stage. Yeah. So, no, you weren't standing behind me, but all right. <laughs> well, and what is, Good shot. <laughs> what, is, what is your relationship with the tapers like now since leaving the dead? Well, now I, I, I don't really have a relationship with them other, other than when somebody knows it's me and they thank me. Sure. You know, uh, I'll be, I've stood in line at, at a gig and, and had people tear, people talking about me. I'm standing next to them, but they don't have, I've been pretty invisible. I've maintained my invisibility. It's part of what I did on the stage with the dead was be invisible, be able to do things, move around, get things done, fix things, that kind of stuff. Because sure. I just was very invisible about it. I, <laughs> But yet, I had to pick up half of that 350 amp. If I didn't, those boys would have laugh, laughed me right off the road. Mm. Yeah, jump into that, I guess, just as broadly as possible. You know, you, the, the Grateful Dead's crew were not exclusively, <laughs> but, ass. you know, <laughs> primarily men. What was it like for you primarily, to be? Primarily, we're getting and primarily ruffians, you know, <laughs> on a level. Sure. I mean, I, I worked with other crews, and they were really nice, you know, pleasant people, all this. That's not how yeah. our guys were. They okay. were, uh, all I can say is kind of badass about how they did everything, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, what was it like for you? How did it feel to be a woman working on that crew? Uh, it just felt like uh, crew. I always felt like crew. I don't okay. go into a situation feeling like I'm a woman doing this. It's I'm me doing this. Sure. I just happen to be a woman. Excuse me. I just happen to be a woman. But I'm just doing the thing that you're doing. It's just my gender is different. Sure. You know, uh, I don't present, project myself as female first. Sure. That's not, I project myself as Betty. Of course. This is who I am. And this is what I do. And talk to me like that, which has been a challenge over the years, extreme challenge, because you're not looked at as that way. You can't possibly be saying that, or you can't possibly be doing that, or you can't possibly, excuse me. I'm actually the one in charge. You're actually going to have to deal with me. Sorry. Mm. Sorry to bust your bubble here. But, <laughs> sure. but I mean, as the years go by, I mean, I've done that. I've always done that. That's just what you have to deal with. Well, there weren't any. I was the first female rock and roll recording engineer producer, I think. Yeah. Ever. So you, I was not expected to be that, but I could get away with things like when I uh, mastered working man's dead. I went down by myself, the band's on the road. I'm there by myself. I'm going, oh, crap, it's on me. And I decided I didn't like what Columbia did. They had a standard, you know, format that they, this is what we do when we master a record. We put this level on, do this, you know, mm -hmm. especially like normalizing or something before there was normalizing. And uh, I just didn't like it. You know, it just didn't suit me. So I decided I went into to an independent studio and, and they set up what they did, and then I decided I didn't like that, and then I just changed everything to what sounded right to me because it was the only thing I could defend or present because it was I couldn't present something of somebody else's work and say I had anything to do with it. You know, I had the project was left in my hands, so I had to make decisions, and I did. I decided to do it the way I liked it. Yeah, and 
held my breath as the band came back from the road and we all sat down to listen to it. And I was like, oh God, what's it going to sound like? Put it on and everybody's mouth dropped up and they went, whoa, that's it. You're doing all the mastering from now on. You know, it sounded just so much better than the format shit that came out of Columbia. Sure. <laughs> And was there, because, you know, obviously there were other women on the Grateful Dead crew. We've talked about Candace, even, you know, Donna being in the band. Was there a sense of camaraderie amongst the, the women on the crew? Uh, nah, I wouldn't say so. Okay. Not really. I mean, John and I were friends, sure. for sure. Uh, Candace, we didn't, she was on her, she was separate from us. She had her own thing. She was her own business, her own. She was somebody that was hired to go along. She wasn't Grateful Dead crew. Got it. So I was the only Grateful Dead female crew member. Okay. In fact, yeah, there were girls working in the office, which is where I had some confrontations just because I went on the road. I worked with the guys that they didn't, you know, and that caused a little tension there. <laughs> sure. I take a lot I of hours to the office, though. <laughs> and what, what was your relationship with Donna like? Oh, it was it was good. Uh, and Cole and Zion, our our boys, mm -hmm. practically grew up together, played together a lot. And we are on the road together. They spent more time on the road than pretty much any of the other. I mean, they were the two that were on the road. Rudson was out there some, uh, mostly around home. But but uh, Cole and Zion traveled. Uh, Donna had a babysitter along, so she sure. Was, and then you know, and I used to do Garcia gigs. I just, I mean, Cole, my son Cole's first gig, he was four days old and he was in a we were doing keystone berkeley with garcia band because that was the first gig you know i'd been there the first day he was born if there'd been a gig that day but there wasn't so <laughs> had to wait four days for a gig sure yeah, yeah, yeah. so i just take the quarter crib along and set up in freddie's office and record so oh. my kid's been pretty much uh filled with this stuff from almost day one <laughs> that's that's sweet uh, you see him in the big old dead movie, me nursing him. I, they kept that in. It's like crap. <laughs> I get reminded of that. Oh, I saw you in there. You did not see me. Actually, all right. you saw me holding a kid. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get there. You, I, you took a, a break from recording from the mid 80s to the, the early 10s when you started recording with the, the Chris Robinson band. Um, I, this is for the audience. I know you know this, but, um, what was that like to jump into, jump back into this world with slightly, you know, not even, you know, different technology than what you were used to using? Well, it wasn't that much different. I mean, there's some, I mean, it really came down to, uh, not so much a board because I ended up with an, getting an analog board of Midas, but, um. Uh, the recording technique is no longer doing tape, which is certainly a lot easier than tape. Tape was, you know, a problem. I mean, it was beautiful and it was continuous. And that's where the dot to dot comes in when you go to digital. It's sure always a space between. And when they first came out, I remember going to AES and hearing Sony's first multi-track digital recorder. And I said, I can hear the edge of the word. Mm -hmm. I, I can hear that. You know, it didn't have enough bits. I mean, I'm hearing the damn edge each time you know i know i'm not supposed to but i do but then i hear things that i'm not supposed to hear a lot sure <laughs> i got i'm going to that some other time a measurements john meyer took of my of my hearing which was freaked him out <laughs> okay and has your approach or your philosophy in terms of making these recordings changed from now with the chris robinson band to what you were doing with the dead not really, because I'm once again I'm capturing. Sure. I'm not trying to do something. I mean, my my art form is capturing their art form, kind of. Yeah. And putting it in a space that I feel is big enough or full enough, or you could feel it around you uh, enough, opening it up to for the air, so you can walk amongst the instruments. So you can be, you can stand on stage. You're either in the front row, or you're standing on stage, or you're sitting next to Billy, or are you, you know, somewhere that you're involved in the music. And that hasn't changed. I still want to do that. I still want to represent everybody as, you know, you've got to do something that you can play as a stereo record that people sit down and hear the whole band. But at the same time, I like there to be that kind of space of movement within that music, which is whatever way 
I choose to make that happen. <laughs> yeah. I have various ways. But anyway, yeah. That's cool. So, no, not really. It hasn't really changed. It's still trying to capture what they're doing. I'm not trying to, you know, put a lot of parts on it or do any, obviously, because it's live when it comes to live. I mean, I've done lots of studio albums, too, and that's fun doing layers of stuff. But I really enjoy capturing what is because there's so much energy involved in live music and there's so much more feeling it's just it's so much more magical than playing a record i mean you you like the music you want to hear it again but places that are gone to the uh, this the way that music gets stretched out and it's so much more emotional when it's live yeah I was wondering when it comes to like, for example, on Europe 72, they took the live recordings and then overdubs were done in the studio to tighten the live recordings up a little bit. Were you involved in that process? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was just some of the vocal tightens up. It wasn't the in the music. Sure. I mean, it was just the vocals that got tight. And what was that like to help the band kind of recreate the the vocals but in we the just set it up like a stage in the studio and had okay. everybody playing so the leakage was like leakage like it would have been on stage i mean the room is smaller because it's not a bigger room it's not a yeah it's a studio it's like you know uh but we still set it up that way so it was like playing on stage okay that's cool that's interesting thank you now you were there for many many you know from the late sixties through the mid eighties. So you got to hear a lot of songs just be born through the, the, your time with the band. How did it feel to hear a new Grateful Dead song? Oh, it's great. And they changed at times and they get worked out as, as far as tempo yeah. and maybe certain, you know, aspects of where a certain change would happen exactly and how it would go down and who would be part of that change as far as instrumentation. Uh, that was great. It was great to watch them grow and say, oh, that's that version of it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I listened to, I had it on the, I had 77 on in my car to do the, the uh, dancing in the streets and they go through that change. That's just so, that whole other change that wasn't there at first. They used to just play it like the song and then they put in that whole like jazzy change there in the middle. It, yeah, and, the and, chromatic you know, section. That thing that, that, yeah. That came out of the word, which was really cool. This is a great, way to change the song you know it makes it so much more you know yeah and so much more grateful dead like <laughs> yes absolutely i hear my phone going deep deep <laughs> that's the good ears you got um, yeah i'm not really actually i just cold and my ears got all blocked up and oh. i went back this morning to the ear doctor he said my called canals are totally cool but it's the cochlei behind it that's i feel like i'm listening on, on the bottom of the pool sure you know which is <laughs> I got all this liquid in there. I'm going, oh, God, this is so weird. You know, I hear everything inside my head. Ah, going to make me crazy. Anyway, I have to go pick up some antibiotics or something when I leave here. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Try them out again. So, oh, the ears are fine. Yeah, they're fine, except for the fact the thing behind them that sends the vibrations to my brain is full of whatever. Yes. Yeah. And it sounds like jelly. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, J jumping back a little bit, just as we talk about the songs, I, obviously, you know, you, you have heard so many of them. Do you have a, a favorite Grateful Dead song? Well, I like Stella Blue, Bach, Peter. Uh, okay. I love the way they do Violet Blues. <laughs> okay. Sure. Grateful Dead song. Anyway, uh, I have a lot of favorites. Yeah. I, I imagine <laughs> I most... Deadhead struggle to pick one favorite, so I would imagine. Yeah, it's just, you know, yeah. I mean, as far as like on the '77 album, the part going into Fire on the Mountain, mm -hmm. and Jerry does uh, his solo like uh, eight bars or sixteen bars he does there, and the last four are absolutely perfect. They resolve to the absolute, exact, perfect thing. Yeah, and that to me is the most perfect. Little four bars <laughs> of anything. It's just that's it. There it is, right there. That's awesome. And it makes me feel that way every time I hear it. It's like ah, yeah, played exactly perfect things. Like, <laughs> have you seen any of the 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 dead offshoot bands? The various your further, your dead and company, your fare thee well, your fill and friends. Any of those bands? Oh yeah, lots of. Them. I mean, I spent a lot of time with DSO. 
for sure. Okay. It took, me a, took them a while to get me to go. <laughs> I sure. said, my son, should you go down to the Fillmore and see what these guys are like? And he came back and he said, it was weird, mom. <laughs> it, was, it was, it was strange. These guys are playing, you know, <laughs> you know, they're trying to, you know, it was the first real Grateful Dead cover band that was trying to be the Grateful Dead or present like yeah. the Grateful Dead. And, uh, as far as instrumentation and all that, they've gotten so they're they're amazing, you know. Yeah, they've gotten so good, and they should have a big following. You know, it's it's hard to be a cover band and get releases out there because you're you're doing stuff that's already out there by the you know the band. But you could sure you know give the audience a good time. I tell you, I mean people that follow. I mean that was always a phenomenon to me that people actually followed the Dead tours. You, yeah, people actually go from place to place and you're not on crew what the hell <laughs> that's pretty weird you know that you travel all over the country that's all you do you carry around all over the country to go to shows it's like, that's bizarre i don't know what you you know that's how shakedown street developed i assume people making enough money to be able to go to the next show yeah uh, which is that's quite an industry they started on their own you know it's yeah far out <laughs> i mean it is a phenomenon it, Definitely was phenomenal. I mean, people go to shows and they love their bands, but they don't follow them all over the country. Yeah, that is. So what was yeah. The question? <laughs> what was that question? Yeah. What did you it just? You know, what did you think of the when you saw the the dead offshoot bands? What was your first reaction to like actually when you finally got to hear DSO? Some I thought were terrible. Some I thought were good. You know, I mean, this, our DSO has gotten great. Yeah, really great. Uh, I've seen this this one recently, Jerry's Middle Finger, which have done. They do a Jerry show. Uh, yeah, they do Jerry shows, and they're they're they've been really good. You know, they've really. Uh, I saw them New Year's, and it was really great. And there's some band, God, I don't know what their name is, that does. So there's another supposedly Jerry band one that does it like DSO. They play whole shows with the same oh. kind of personnel. And they do it like the DSO format, only for Garcia bands. Sure. Uh, I haven't seen them yet. I hear they're really good. I might go see them tomorrow night. We'll see. Okay, cool. Possibly. <laughs> and by the way, Melvin's fabulous. Sure, of course. <laughs> oh, of course. course. GGB. Yeah. Melvin would, you know, and John who plays, I mean, Melvin, JGB now is, 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 is a wonderful experience. I mean, sometimes... Yeah. It's like it's like it's going to church, you know. <laughs> With Melvin, sometimes it's yeah. it's amazing. I haven't gotten to see this this JGB line. I saw Melvin play with O'Teal and Friends about six months ago, and that oh, was just cool oh. to hear him sing. You know, "Cats Under the Stars" or Ruben and Sharice. Uh -huh. um, it's just a certain kind of magic and connection that you don't get well, hearing. When Melvin came out. Melvin first showed up at at Front Street at, at my studio. He came in the door. I was the only one there, and he and he came in, and I invited him. Yeah, sure, come on in. And I said, "What's going on?" He said, "Well, you're supposed to meet somebody here, and he's going to play the organ." And I said, "Oh, okay." So I went and fired up the Leslie for him. Got the B three going, you know. Yeah. You want to play the organ here? Let me hook it up for you and go play. And then then Jerry showed up. It was Jerry had had him come there to play for him. And it was, so we he started with uh, "Run for the Roses." Yeah. And his lick on that one was the defining lick. I told him that. I've told him that more than once, I think. See, when he played that that opening lick, I'd run the little riff on the organ. That's it. That yeah. defines the song. That defines all of it. So there it is, you know. I'm done. I'm good. <laughs> that that finished me. I'm a, I'm cool with everything now, you know. That's awesome. And then just to to pivot so that we can be vaguely on on topic for the show and what we do, um we we are planning to talk about uh, May 26th, 1973 at the, and you'll forgive an East Coaster for struggling to pronounce this correctly. It's Keysar Stadium. Keysar Stadium. Okay. <laughs> yes. That's, I, I have spent <laughs> the last three days going to Keysar. Okay. That's what the 49ers used to play way back. Oh, Never. gotcha. Yeah. yeah, I'm, I come from a Giants family. Two shows so I, I don't know how to say the word Giants. Snack benefit or yeah. the other one? I think this must be the other one. I think it was the other one. Yeah, because they played so long. You know, like, yes. That it had to be just them. It couldn't have been all those other bands. Yeah, no, not with the, the nearly four hours Wait, of music that's songs. been recorded. It wouldn't have been any other more time. Uh, anyway. So, yeah, that was, uh, Keysar was a trip. 
I think that was Wall of Sound era. I mean, I don't know if you put that in there or not. This would have been pre Wall of Sound. This Just would have been we Wall of Sound out. Think, yeah. Yeah. Do you have any, you know, memories of of the show of recording the well, show? Remembering it just being fun at 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 Kizar and and Rex and I, be, uh, you know, him helping me set up my stuff just for fun yeah. because I wasn't, you know, doing that kind of stuff, the the Betty boards kind of stuff at that point. But I brought, I was doing Garcia band all the time. Yeah, I always it was anywhere nearby. I did Garcia band in whatever form it was. I always went. And then Jerry'd come by in the morning and listen to the tapes after, you know. Come by and have a cappuccino and listen to the tapes. <laughs> so I had all that stuff together, so I just took it down for the dead, you know, for the hell of it. Yeah. And set it up and did that, which was always fun. I mean, I, my most favorite thing to do is record. Yeah. Can I say? You should do what you love. Would Jerry and, and the rest of the band regularly listen to the recordings that you made? Uh, somewhat. I, for a while on the road, Mickey wanted me to set up a whole playback system after every show. Okay. So I'd have to go to the hostility suite, uh, the hospitality, anyway, the hostility suite, set up, you know, a, a Nakamichi and some ADS speakers and playback, you know, either the cassettes or I'd set up the Nagra. I did that something. I'd set up the Nagra and play it back. Then it just got to be, this is too much. I'm doing this for these people that are coming to listen. You come and listen. The band wanders in and out. They just, you know, it's like, I don't think I'm going to do this every night. <laughs> this sure. really, you know, hell with this. You know, you guys listen when you get home. So, uh, Jerry's the one that would consistently come over the next day and listen. That was his band. That's cool. Because I was on the way to the office, you know. He lived in Stinson. And sure. Come over the hill. I was in Mount Valley. He'd stop by, get a haircut, have a cappuccino, listen to some music, then go to the office. You know? yeah, kind of a regular routine. Yeah. That's cool. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Well, Elton, Elton snuck in. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, well, that's really all I have. Betty, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for, for being on this episode, for taking the time to talk to me um, as someone who has been listening to your recordings for many. I'm a second generation deadhead. So. Uh, I've yeah, you have up. to be. <laughs> yeah. Art Miller is all first timers left. My God. Um, yeah, as someone who you know grew up listening to your tapes and still listens to your tapes in this day, it's this is really cool and really surreal for me. Uh, so thank you so much for being a part of the show. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. And yes, I'd like to definitely say that uh, DSO, Chris Robinson, and well, now they're doing Black Crows. Yeah. Uh, I did get to record with As the Crow Flies, which was a great show. Anyway, but uh, uh, we'll see. I'm not sure what kind of uh, instrumentation he's going to have this time. We'll see what he's got in the band. But, but uh, and then the uh, Jazz Fest coming up. DSO will be down there with a bunch of our people. Oh, nice. And that'll be fun. So anyway, 73 yeah. was a great year. Got to say, yeah. it was a great year. <laughs> so thank you so much and take care. Keep enjoying, keep listening. All right. Good. Oh, bye will bye. do. Okay. <laughs> bye. All right. Um, thank you all so much for tuning into this episode. Um, we'll be back on Thursday with our regular episodes. Um, I'm not used to doing the ending bit. Uh, if you like this episode, you can find us anywhere. You can listen to podcasts, except for ones that rhyme with Spotify, by which I mean we're not on Spotify, but we're everywhere else. Um, you can email us at helponthewaypod at gmail.com uh, if you ever want to get in contact with us. We're also always pinned on reddit.com slash r slash grateful dead. Um, yeah, just keep tuning in to our weekly threads and chatting and hanging and stuff like this will keep happening. Um, thank you all so much for tuning into this episode. Thanks again for Betty for being here on behalf of all of us on the Help on the Way podcast. Have a good night or afternoon or morning, whenever you're listening to the show. Mm -hmm.